I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra. With me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about the Yemen. In fact, now also about Saudi Arabia, Iran, the United States, the biggest flashpoint currently on the world map today. We have an audience of distinguished experts, even more distinguished than normal, and some enthusiastic amateurs like me. When we establish this subject for this program, it was not the case that everyone in the world was talking about Yemen. Five years nearly of incessant warfare, mass starvation, polio epidemics, cholera epidemics, ports being blockaded, children dying emaciated like sticks, and nobody in the world caring anything at all about it. In fact, some people in the world making a very fat profit from the starvation of the children of Yemen. School buses bombed, schools bombed, wedding parties bombed, brides killed at the altar of their own weddings, and even funeral parties, mourning the dead of the last air raid being attacked and creating many more corpses. No one gave a damn. A hundred thousand, maybe much more than a hundred thousand. Yemenis in the poorest country on the earth, living next door to the richest countries on the earth, being decimated by this almost five years of warfare. Nobody gave a toss. One airstrike, or drone strike, or missile strike on an oil refinery in Saudi Arabia, where not a single person was killed, has catapulted this subject right to the top of the international agenda. 5% of world oil production was incapacitated at a single stroke causing a surge of price rises throughout the international markets. At one stage, the price of oil rose by more than 10%. Chaos seemed to loom in the international economy. The question was, who to blame? And once you had decided on who to blame, how to explain? How to explain that Saudi Arabia, which has spent literally trillions of dollars on weapons, on missile shields, on all the paraphernalia which ought to have made it impregnable, could so easily be struck and devastated by, the first allegation, drones. Did the missile shields not work? And if they didn't work, what's the point of buying them? What's the point of spending all this money on defending yourself if actually you are defenseless against drones? Well, in the first moments, people accepted that it was the Ansar Allah, the resistance in Yemen, which has stood up for these five years against the Saudi, Emirati, American, British, Israeli attack on poor Yemen. And we were treated to the usual story that the Houthis could only be as effective as this if Iran was helping them. Then, miraculously, amongst the ashes in the oil refinery, they found the usual passports. Well, in this case, not exactly a passport, but a made-in-Iran 
smelling of halva, <laughs> picture of the ayatollahs on a dud which never went off. And so the Saudis began to say that this attack did not come from the south, neither did it come from Iraq, it came directly from Iran itself. But there are problems with that narrative, obviously. If it was what they call the Houthis, they like to sectarianize this conflict as a Sunni-Shia conflict. If it was the Houthis, imagine what Iran could do. <laughs> and if it was Iran that caused this shockwave across the world with one drone strike, what could it do if it opened all guns blazing? Suddenly, the threats of President Trump were locked and loaded. He loves those Wild West metaphors. We're locked and loaded. Well, if you're locked and loaded, you better fire. But you're not going to fire, are you? Think about it. If you fire, they'll fire back. And if that's what they could do with one strike, what about 10,000 strikes? So you're locked and loaded, but you can't fire. So in that case, you're going to have to back down. How do you back down from the kind of threats amplified by the US media that we saw in the days immediately following uh, the attack on the oil refinery? If it was the Yemenis, why shouldn't they fight back? What, what kind of a war is this where only one side is allowed to kill the other side? You can launch countless thousands of air raids on people as long as they're defenseless. And if they hit back, it's some kind of crime. And if they hit back and don't even kill a single person, that is regarded as a worse crime than killing children on a school bus. You see where I'm going with this? You see the international geopolitical complications of all this? Well, they do in the White House, that's for sure. So if you ask me the question right now, is the United States going to attack Iran? I'll have to laugh in your face because that wouldn't just be a disaster for the region. It would actually be perfectly absurd. It would be the most ridiculous, absurd blunder ever made by any government at any time. Because as I've been saying throughout this long crisis, Iran is not Iraq in 2003. Iran is not Grenada, a defenseless little island that you can Hollywood style land your Marines on the beach. Iran is a country of 80 million people, most of them young people, most of them united on at least one thing, that they will not allow foreigners to attack their country. And with millions of people in their country, for whom they're not just ready to die, it would actually be quite an honor for them to die fighting the United States of America. Believing, entirely believing, that paradise is the destination for someone who dies fighting the United States of America, the great Satan. Now, these are not the only problems Yemen has. There's a, a number of old problems coming back to haunt Yemen. The principal one of those is secession. It has been made uh, abundantly easy by international Western-driven policy for the idea to return back to the table of Yemen being not one state, but two. I've got to tell you, I'm old enough to have visited Yemen when it was two. I quite liked the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. I've got to tell you that right up front. But it's been 30 years or more since Yemen reunified, and 
Now there are people who want to divide it again and they're not the kind of people that used to run the PDRY. Saudi Arabia would quite like to see the division of Yemen. I'm personally against the division of countries, but you could see their point. Uh, the access to the sea that a South Yemen state would have, the importance of that sea, its proximity to the Gulf, are all reasons why imperialism and its local auxiliaries would want to see that kind of division. There's division inside the resistance itself uh, between uh, people who were once enemies, then friends, now drifting towards enemy status again. So you drop a uh, pebble in a pool, it becomes a tidal wave, eventually sweeping much away uh, in its uh, wake. So we're talking today about Yemen, but about the importance of Yemen and the conflict there to the region and the world. Let me hand over to my first guest, Madame, welcome back. Uh, I said we had a distinguished audience. You're one of the, the most distinguished of the audience. Please introduce yourself and say what you would like to say. Good afternoon to you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's actually amazing to hear you speak uh, about the situation as it really is, truthfully and honestly, fearlessly. If all uh, people in the Western Hemisphere spoke about the reality of this aggression on Yemen in the way you just did, the suffering that is ongoing to this day wouldn't continue. Unfortunately, as we have said this before, there is hypocrisy. Lie is true, true is lie, and so forth. Bad is good, good is by, uh, good, good is bad, and so forth. And that's what's actually, what's actually killing the people of Yemen on a daily basis by hundreds through hunger, through preventable diseases, through airstrikes, through terrorism, through assassinations paid for directly by the Saudi regime. And uh, so that's what's happening. Let me introduce myself. I'm speaking, I'm wearing two hats today. I'm wearing my hat as a British lawyer who is familiar with the laws of this land as well as the laws of the international uh, platform. And also uh, my new hat as uh, the re permanent representative for the state of Yemen at the United Nations elect. And uh, elect because, of course, uh, the uh, acknowledgement of the legitimate government of Sana'a hasn't taken place yet for obvious reasons, because they want to pretend or continue to tell the world the lies that is just a handful of Houthi rebels, which we need to now uh, put down and get rid of because they are troublemakers and, and, and so forth. When the fact is, and I'm telling you from knowledge, personal knowledge, and my, through my work, that the government of Sana'a contains 16 members of the Congress party, that is former President Saleh's party, 16 members. They are the majority. Uh, it, it has about 12 members of Ansar Allah, AKA Houthi. It has about four communists, two nationalists, many other parties that uh, have grown uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the period from 2011 to date. So many political parties parties have come about in Yemen. There is a vibrant democratic movement of liberation and freedom from hegemony from the neighboring uh, countries who have no idea what democracy is, who have no idea what a constitution is, who have no idea what a republic is. Sana'a government enjoys uh, millions and millions of Yemeni support who come flock to the streets of Sana'a. Today, in fact, they are celebrating five years of the glorious revolution of Yemen. And uh, you will see millions of them flocking to the streets of uh, Sana'a, some of them buying their homes and their possessions in order to be able to get there. Majority of the Yemenis, including those from the South Southern provinces and Maghreb are internally displaced people having left those parts due to the widespread of terrorism. And now I'm going to touch on the point of the uh, 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 cessation. I personally am originally, my family are from Hadramaut, and we know a lot about the grievances. A lot of my family have had to leave uh, Yemen and go to Africa. And to this day, we have no contact with some of them. We've lost contact with them. So yes, we have grievances. And it was this cart of grievances that the Saudi coalition coalition has played emotionally on the people of the South and made them believe that they will be uh, uh, um, turned in an to an independent state, successful, rich, as uh, very much like Dubai. Five years later, what do we find?
find 18 detention centers, secret detention centers where women, children and men are being raped with batons. Evidence has come out through APS. Evidence has come out through Reuters, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty. Everybody has reported on this, but nobody wants to talk about it because it's too hush-hush. Second thing, we have got this uh, Southern uh, uh, Transitional Council, which has been up now as the, uh, the, the separatist movement. Now, let me tell you some basic facts about these people. By the way, I am with the Harak, which is the original article of the uh, secessionist uh, party. And a lot of the leaders of the secessionist party of the South are now actually in Sana'a supporting the government of Sana'a. As part of the government of Sana'a, uh, the deputy minister for sports in Sana'a is uh, a secessionist and quite many others. And I myself am part of that uh, family group of people who want our rights upheld. We have grievances and we're not going to forget that. Now, who caused the grievances is Ali Mohsen Al-Ahmar, the head of terrorism in Yemen, who is now in Riyadh from the Islah party, right? And uh, instead of addressing the issue with the person who caused the grievances, unfortunately, our people in the South have been manipulated to death. To death, literally, 16, 18 detention centers, rapes and pillaging and thefts and all of that. And terrorism every day, suicide bombing every day. But human life has become so meaningless that anybody can be just pulled into the streets and shot like that and they photograph it and they put it in social media. Now, who is the uh, new uh, kids in the block? I call them the new kids in the block because they are. They are people whose age group ha tells you that they haven't even known anything about the 1990s war, which caused the grievances, right? These guys are very young, so they don't know what the uh, grievances was all about. And their leaders, and their leaders are, one of them, well-known, Hani bin Break, is a man who was wanted for terrorism by the US regime for many years. He's the deputy reader. So if we allow this secession, which I'm going to say some more thing about it because there's legal uh, issues here. If they hand over, I can tell you, if they by force, because they've been doing everything by force and lying to the world. If they hand over the South to, this new, to these new kids in the block, which the original secessionists don't acknowledge, it means basically the strategically very important part of the world is going to be set alight because these are Salafi Wahhabis who don't accept anybody else. Hani bin Break is a well-known ACAB member. I don't understand why the US hasn't picked him up. Instead, the US is just sending drones, killing civilians in other parts instead of actually getting the man who's causing all of this. If the US really wants to fight terrorism, this is their man. Well, the US has been supporting Al-Qaeda and ISIS in many places uh, and indeed was the uh, advertently or inadvertently, the father of al-Qaeda in the first place in Afghanistan in the uh, 1980s. But you don't have to look further than Syria to see the United States arming, financing, proselytizing for al-Qaeda and ISIS and these other Islamist uh, uh, killers. And that's exactly what you're describing now as happening in Yemen. Indeed. Just a final point, please. One, fi one final point. The se secession cannot happen by force. It has to happen by process of law. And the process of law is to hold a national referendum. We can't hold a referendum while there is piracy being committed against the state of Yemen. 13 ships are being unlawfully detained by the Saudi regime, which contains food and fuel. People are dying. And they're doing this deliberately to force the people to submit to Saudi law, which they will not do. The airport in Sana'a continues to be closed, which is clear claiming thousands of lives every month. This is horrific. Like, Yemen has become one big concentration camp. We really need to say this loud. I know people don't like to hear this word, but that's what we are witnessing every day, and something has to be done. If it's not done, then I am confident that the government of Sana'a will be continue to sending drones everywhere. And that is not in the best interest of everyone concerned. Secession is not going to happen without due process of law. It has to happen through referendum. I am from the South, and I'm saying, no, until after we hold the referendum, let our people choose. We okay. have to have a democratic process, uh, take not this, uh, a uh, sheikh gentleman, process. This gentleman here, yeah. you're itching to respond. My name is Nasal. I say I come from South Yemen. It's South Yemen. No South Yemen. And uh, I speak in Arabic because it's the best way for me. Of course, the in Yemen is the between the south and the south. ليس صراع الحوثيين والإصلاح وعلي محسن الأحمر هؤلاء كلهم أحزاب شمالية نورث يمن آه عبد رب منصور هادي المجلس الانتقالي من الجنوب الصراع في حقيقة هو بين الشمال والجنوب آه الصراع لم يكن بين أحزاب لكن العالم هو يظهر العالم بهذا الشكل 
الحقيقة أنه الحوثيين في هذه اللحظة هم لديهم تحالف مع تنظيم القاعدة وقبل يومين يعني قبل يومين كان هناك في تبادل الأسرى بينهم وبين القاعدة في محافظة البيضاء محافظة البيضاء التي سيطر عليها الحوثيين الآن تنظيم القاعدة موجودين في البيضاء وكذلك الإصلاح وعلي محسن الأحمر متحالفين مع أنصار الشريعة أو داعش متواجدين الآن في مأرب هذه هي الحقيقة بالنسبة للشيخ هاني هذا كلام غير صحيح هي مجرد افتراءات الحوثيين يتحالفون مع القاعدة الذي كان يديرهم علي عبد الله صالح علي عبد الله صالح سلم الملف للحوثيين الآن لن نسمع خلال الخمس سنوات أن أن القاعدة عملوا أي أي تفجير أو أي عملية ضد الحوثيين كل عملهم بالجنوب وكذلك داعش يقودهم علي محسن الأحمر وهو من الشمال وكل أعمال داعش متواجدة بالجنوب الآن الحرب هي شمالية جنوبية هذه في حقيقة الأمر لن يصلح هناك أي حل في اليمن إلا بحل الدولتين لأن هذا الصراع هو صراع تاريخي صحيح الجنوب كان دولة مستغلة والشمال دولة مستغلة وتم اتباقية الوحدة في عام 1990 يو توك أباوت يمن ديمقراطيك يو ناو يعني فكان الوحدة استمرت ثلاث سنوات بعد ثلاث سنوات تم إخلال بالاتفاقية بين الشمال والجنوب من قبل نظام اليمن الشمالي وتم احتلال الجنوب في عام 1994 بالتحالف مع نظام اليمن الشمالي مع تنظيم القاعدة جابوه من أفغانستان ومن كل المناطق في في العالم وقذوا بهم الجنوب وبعد ذلك استمرت المقاومة الجنوبية قبل أن يأتي التحالف العربي المقاومة الجنوبية أول عمل عسكري لها كان في عام 1997 بحركة موج وحركة تغيير المصير وحركة وبعدها في عام 2011 تم تحرير أربع مديريات من محافظة لحج وأربع مديريات من محافظة أبين وأربع مديريات من محافظة الضالع من قبل المقاومة الجنوبية المقاومة الجنوبية قاومة كل القوات الشمالية كان حوثي إصلاحي تبع علي عبد الله صالح قاوموهم بشكل متساوي صحيح الحوثيين ربما أنه يعني لديهم مشروع طائفي سلالي مدعوم من إيران وهذا ربما أنه يعني يعني أعطى معنوية أكبر للمقاومة الجنوبية لمقاومتهم لكن نحن الآن في هذه اللحظة نقاوم قوات الإرهاب التابع لعلي محسن الآن في شبوة وفي حضرموت ونقاتلهم لأنه الشعب في الجنوب يعتبرهم إرهابيين ويعتبرهم قوات احتلال للجنوب نحن لا نتعامل كدولة واحدة أنتم دولة وإذا كان الحوثي له قبول بالشمال فليتفق مع الإصلاح ومع المؤتمر ويشكل لهم دولة لا يساعدنا مشكلة مع الحوثيين أهم شيء نحن في الجنوب أن نحصل على استغلالنا ودولتنا والحوثيين يعني يفكون ارتباطهم بإيران وعدم إغلاقنا كجيران لهم وكذلك محيطنا العربي وأمتنا العربية الإسلامية قبل كل شيء Well, there are two issues obviously now on the table. The first is the Saudi, Emirati, American, British, Israeli war against Yemen, against all of Yemen, against all Yemenis. And as you've just witnessed, there is the issue, it's an old one, but it's back, as to whether Yemen should be divided. And if divided, by whom? On what basis? And what will be the geopolitical result if it is? We'll uh, be back after this break with much more of this. Watching Kali Mahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, discussing events in Yemen and the surrounding area. Earlier, we took the Kali Mahara camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Take a look. The uh, war on Yemen has been going on for five years now. Has the uh, US-Saudi policy been a success or a failure? Uh, well, uh, it sounds like a failure to me. If the war is still going on, that probably is the worst outcome. All I can see through the media is there's been a lot of children that's been killed and that um, if the US and the UK are actually supplying arms to um, Saudi Arabia, I think they ought to reconsider that. Um, in my opinion, if the war is still ongoing. I don't think it's been quite successful. 
Um, I think it's been a failure in the sense that I think it needs to be greatly improved upon. I think because of the fighting and devastation, I wouldn't say it's a complete failure, but it's definitely not a success for the people of Yemen, nor I think the United States. My instinct would be to say no, <laughs> because of who's in power at the moment and general um, foreign policy in the US. Uh, why do you think that the proxies of the allies, such as the US, Israel, Saudi, UAE, are now fighting each other uh, in the south of Yemen? Oh, uh, I, I don't know a huge amount about it. Um, I, uh, if they're fighting each other, then I guess it's for control of the region. It's, uh, it may be about trade, uh, trade agreements and, uh, and their friends in the area. Access to ports, possibly. That's only speculation. But, um, um, why they're fighting, I think it's all, all around oil, basically. That's, that's the main thing. I don't know if it's like a divide and conquer, or I don't know if it's a tactic from the other side for them to be fighting. I think because there are so many different countries taking so many different sides, I think that all the proxies started fighting each other, and I think that they all need to reevaluate kind of the end goal for the people of Yemen to make sure that there's a policy in place that they, as a government, can move forward in a positive direction to make sure that the government is sound and that the people have a stable government that they can rely on to ensure the well-being of all the citizens. In terms of most war, it would be for some sort of control over the area and there will be probably some sort of financial benefit to whoever wins. But um, I think this situation with, um, with Iran certainly has to de-escalate de because that's very, very serious um, for everybody. I mean, the Middle East and um, the surrounding countries, the UK and every, everybody, I think that's a, you know, that, that's a, a very serious situation that's going on at the moment. Well, that was the view from the streets of London. Let's uh, continue to hear what is here in the studio. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam. Al-Hakiqa, Sayyidi, that the Asra'a is present in Yemen, and the war is a war of violence. So all the Asra'a is a war of violence to the countries. والحل هو في إطلاق عملية سلام لا تستثني أحدا تحت إشراف الأمم المتحدة اليمن لا يحتاج إلى دولة مدنية سنية أو شيعية اليمن يحتاج إلى دولة مدنية تحتضن الجميع وعند إطلاق هذه العملية عملية السلام بموجبها يتم تشكيل حكومة مدنية ذات مشاركة شاملة وفترة انتقالية لفترة محددة يتم فيها تحقيق العدالة الانتقالية ثم عملية ديمقراطية والصناديق هي الذي تحكو هي الذي ت... هي الحكم بغير هذا الحل سنظل ندور في حلقة مفرغة لأنه في ظل الاستقطاب الحاد من الإقليم من دول الإقليم إيران والسعودية والإمارات وقطر وعمان بالإضافة إلى الولايات المتحدة وروسيا كلهم يتصارعون داخل اليمن وكلهم يطمعون في ثروات اليمن وموقعه الاستراتيجي اليمنيون لا يمانعون أن يحققوا أن تحقق هذه الدول مصالحها المشتركة مع مع اليمن ولكن يكون ذلك في 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 المجال الاقتصادي والتنافس أنهم يتصارعون في بلادنا وبدماء أبنائنا أنهم يدمروا بلادنا ويدمروا ثرواتنا ويدمروا حتى المواقع التاريخية والحضارية لبلدنا نحتاج إلى إلى دعم المجتمع الدولي في تحقيق السلام والتنمية في هذا البلد المهم لا أطيل عليكم لكن أنه قد بهذه الكلمات الموجزة أكيد أنه وصلت الفكرة إلى سعادتكم Thank you uh, The lady there in the middle row uh, Hi, my name is Safa and I've been living in the UK for four years and uh, one of the examples that uh, I can't go back to my country because of Sana'a airport closure and this is one of the most important humanitarian issue that lead to all the Yemeni. Thousands of Yemeni are stuck outside and thousands of Yemeni are injured inside Yemen. They can't go uh, to outside the broad to receive the necessary medication because of 
the Saudi uh, led coalition hit and bombed most of the Yemen's infrastructures, uh, as you know. So hospitals, schools everywhere have been bombed. So uh, this is uh, under the humanitarian law that you cannot uh, prevent the citizens to move from place to another. So uh, this is one of the most important uh, issues that must be discussed and uh, that Sana'a airport uh, closure must be lifted as soon as possible. And um, you, you said in the beginning in your introduction that is the uh, United States going to hit Iran. Definitely not, because they are going to hit Yemen. So all of them agreed <coughs> to hit Yemen. But how no. can they do that if they say that the attack on Saudi Arabia came from Iran? So Iran bombs you, so you bomb Yemen? So the Yemen, uh, Yemeni people as, are asking the same questions. As long as the Yemeni are defending themselves, and this is the legal right to defend themselves, why they are hitting Yemen, not hitting Iran? So this is yeah. my uh, my question, why? It's the a very good question. international community uh, is uh, doing this hypocrisy so this Imagine. is yeah so this is the question is raised by every yeah, yemeni citizen of course it is thank you very much gentleman in the middle thank you george my name is sahal ali i'm political and social commentator of uh, many affairs in the middle east and east africa uh, i like to say uh, the conflict has entered into a new uh, territory a territory dominated by the effectiveness of drone attacks which I believe would change not only the way people settle their differences uh, in this region, but in many parts of the world. We have witnessed it, that the Houthi rebels are relying uh, regularly on these drones. And this year alone, we have seen uh, drones used to attack f oil facilities uh, in Saudi Kingdom. Uh, on, on May the 14th and August the 17th this year alone. And the, m the most effective uh, attack came on the 14th of uh, September. Uh, the question many are asking is, <clears throat> despite Saudis investing heavily and build uh, in, in, in building their own military, and buying a lot of weapons uh, from world's most powerful nations. Uh, their sophisticated satellites have failed and could not detect 10 drones freely roaming over the skies of Saudi Arabia, reaching their tar targets after traveling 1,200 kilometers hitting the two oil facilities and damaging the Saudi oil protection, uh, that means have shown us that the weapons that they have bought became useless and ineffective. And also the anti-missile missile, missile uh, the Saudis bought. The Patriot. The Patriots have become also useless. Uh, I, this reminds me, the, con the conflict reminds me that you have relied on the big powers, United States, and the weapons they gave you. But now you have realized it, that this is not enough to protect you. You are totally exposed to an endless danger from the Houthis. And the whole dream that this conflict <coughs> could have been uh, brought to an end in a matter of months has evaporated because we are all witnesses that it entered in its fifth year. Uh, and the Houthis, in my opinion, are psychologically and militarily gaining momentum at the moment. So what is best? If I am, if you put me into a ring against Mike Tyson, you know I will not, we cannot talk about winning. We will talk about when this gentleman, the thin, uh, uh, slim Somalian, is going to be dying violently. Because there is a wall of difference between me and the person I'm fighting. The Saudis and the Emirates are now beginning to feel the heat. They are beginning to realize, and I have no doubt they're both looking a way out. Thank the you. Emirates have already taken their troops 5,000 out of Yemen, mm. 
and the Saudis have got their feet into the Maribul. The only solution is uh, agreement of a ceasefire and Yemenis to be left alone to decide their own future themselves. I think he, the idea of reinventing the map and dividing Yemen is totally upset and unjust. Yemen have become united and they were developing. Without this intervention, which is started uh, 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 by the Saudis, uh, getting the support of the Emirates and other uh, uh, money-driven nations here, uh, interest-driven nations, uh, is going to have failed now. And I hope that the world supports uh, a way to end this conflict as quickly as possible. Well, let's hear from uh, security and intelligence expert Charles Shoebridge. Charles, I'm not going to ask you to walk us through the labyrinth uh, of internal uh, Yemeni politics, because we don't have time. But what's your overview of the uh, military and geopolitical situation now in the wake of the attack on the Saudi oil fields? Yeah, George, uh, we've heard a lot about the internal politics, just some aspects, and of course there are very many more. And in many ways, even though people are disagreeing, of course that's very encouraging, the fact that there will be um, uh, internal political discourse and that that can be resolved in the course of uh, internal Yemeni politics in due course. But of course what's needed for that to happen is an end to the war. The war needs to end, the blockade needs to end, so that some stability can at least return, so that then politics perhaps in some civil way can take place. And we've also heard comments, which is absolutely accurate, that of course the real crux of the problems in Yemen that ex exacerbates the situation as it has done in Ukraine, as it has done in Syria, Libya and elsewhere, is that you have these domestic internal divisions which are absolutely ruthlessly and endlessly exploited by outside powers. And we have seen that desperately so in the case, of course, in Yemen. And that has been covered and is now actually quite apparent also, even in Western media coverage, which after many years of largely ignoring these incidents, if they take place against Yemeni civilians, by, uh, carried out by uh, British and American allies, the Saudis in particular, by their airstrikes, using, of course, British and American supplied weapons and logistics and so on. That has largely not been covered by the British and American media. Now it's inescapable. It is being covered. And so even there, externally, there is a pressure for this war to come to an end. It has been proved an embarrassment to the British and American governments. And I think Trump particularly, of course, and he has made reference to this, Trump in his instincts, while of course he continues to want to sell uh, billions and billions of dollars worth of arms, as did, as did Obama before him, as does our own uh, government to the Saudis, um, their use in this way has become a distinct embarrassment. And it's made the supply of these weapons more difficult uh, in the future. And of course they would like to remove those difficulties. Um, our colleague here also made a very good point that the use of drones, and it's just one example, is an excellent illustration of the way in which the playing field is being levelled in, in, in these conflicts, especially what would have been uh, in the old days called a low-intensity conflict, in other words, largely a guerrilla campaign, that it can be go onto the strategic level with the use of drones and basic cruise missiles, which I think it's probably, uh, certainly the forensics that's been presented so far, suggests were used in this attack. It's used, worth, relying, uh, worth, worth remembering as well that uh, whilst there's been lots of discussion about uh, whether these were launched, for example, from, uh, uh, from Yemen itself, and we have the uh, precedents for that. I mean, there have many attacks to using drones. Not, the, yeah, their distance is greater. But their distance the, is greater, the, but... The principle is the same. The principle is the same, but also there has been some use of potentially longer-range drones by the Houthis. Um, but also, of course, uh, it's possible that these could have been launched from sympathetic forces in Iraq. Uh, the other option, of course, that's been put about, particularly by the Americans, is that it's been launched from Iran, again, without any specific evidence so far. Um, but one that has been discounted or not mentioned largely, but was mentioned by the Houthis in their original claim, was that it's possible that at least some of these weapons, the drones, were launched from within Saudi Arabia itself, um, bearing in mind that um, there are forces within uh, Saudi Arabia, political and military forces to some degree, that are against the regime there, particularly, of course, in the eastern province, one might talk about that. So it looks as though this attack on this refinery could actually, rather than be an escalation point, could actually be a critical point a path on the path to actually ending this conflict. Because it's raised the stakes to such a level that now this continuation of this conflict threatens the West's economic interests, particularly, of course, in respect of 
oil. Trump might say, as he has done, oh, we don't care about Saudi oil, or oil anymore. That's completely not true, for the time being at least. And so if this disruption to the international economic, economic order can be threatened, and also if the same can be threatened, perhaps not with drones necessarily, but with cruise missiles against the UAE itself, as the Houthis have uh, indicated may be the next step, this is going to cause pause for thought amongst the Saudis and the um, uh, UAE uh, Emiratis themselves. Because we've already got this split that is taking place between the UAE and the Saudis. It's becoming increasingly difficult to hide where basically the UAE uh, pretty much wants out. Yes, they are encouraging different forces. They are encouraging their proxies and they would like to have some control over uh, the riches of the South, the uh, strategic importance of Aden and so on. That's absolutely understood. And this is consistent with what we've seen over the last decade, at least, of uh, the involvement of uh, the Emiratis, the Qataris and so on, in the internal affairs of other uh, Arabic uh, and Middle East and North African countries. So it may well be that this actually can prove a turning point. And indeed, very recently, we've, of course, had following up from the attack, we've had the uh, Houthis actually offering to end these attacks so long as the war ends. And, of course, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Saudis, bearing in mind that the pressure matrix from the West is differing now because of this threat that is now apparent uh, to their economic well-being, and it's a possibility now, perhaps more than ever, that at this very moment that it's escalating, that very escalation may prove, may, may prove to be a, a, a really active strategic genius on the part of the Houthis to bring this to a close so that um, these political developments and discussions that we've had very eloquently illustrated here can take effect perhaps internally. So the, uh, the, the <clears throat> takeaways are that uh, nobody in their right mind would buy a Patriot missile. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me talk, it's a very good point. You see the, the problem is, and we're going to come back to the, the comment that our colleague here said, that the Patriot missile um, is designed to uh, defend against ballistic missiles, like the Scud missiles that um, the Houthis have used quite effectively uh, into uh, Saudi Arabia for some time. And of course, these Scud missiles haven't come from, as it's, uh, the West likes to presume or likes to pretend, from Iran. They've come from the remnants of the Yemeni um, army that is actually with the Houthis or has been allied at different points. And so large parts of the army, of course, are against the uh, government of Hadi and against the Saudis, as you might want to be yourself if your country was attacked in that way. And so the Patriots are of some effectiveness, not full effectiveness, against ballistic missiles such as um, the Scud missile. But, and they have been used by the Houthis so far, but they are absolutely useless against low-tech, low-cost, especially large numbers of drones. And that's why in so many ways, as you've indicated, they are an absolute equaliser. It's, it's in a the changer, a game uh, changer. Uh, but the second, um, the second game changer is that, as I hope I uh, demonstrated in my opening remarks, the United States cannot actually attack Iran. And therefore, anything that ineluctably draws them towards an attack on Iran is something that is against their interests. Let's assume uh, another three drone attacks on another three oil refineries. This is going to provide tremendous pressure on the U.S. to attack Iran, but it can't attack Iran because it will lose. It, it will lose because it doesn't have the stomach, and quite rightly doesn't have the stomach, because it's not in the interests of the U.S., certainly not the U.S. people, to have what undoubtedly would not be, as is being suggested by some hawks in the U.S. media and security establishment, a series of limited, punishing, short-term strikes. It would no, Zarif extreme... said, if you attack us... It's all out war. And the history shows that, uh, that actually those remarks by him are sustainable. They yeah. are probably true. And if you attack Iran, you are going to engage in an extremely long-term uh, conflict. There's no question that uh, a US would ever invade Iran. The cost would be phenomenal in blood and money. Yeah, yeah. And so therefore... We're talking Second World War terms, it, it, uh, levels of... Uh, and casual. to stabilise the entire region and, of course, cause massive problems for the global economy because of the impact on oil prices. The US does not want that. So, of course, it's absolutely restricted in what it can do, despite the fact that, of course, Hawks now departed, such as Bolton, but even Pompeo, do seem to believe in, perhaps at the behest of other countries in the region, of course, notably Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia, remember, doesn't want a full conflict. But countries such as Israel, of course, of which is very powerful in the Washington lobby, um, to actually punish their main enemy, mm. uh, which they see as Iran. Splendid uh, overview. Gentlemen next to you.
My name is Shiram Malik. I'm a um, cybersecurity expert and uh, student of history. Hire this man. <clears throat> That's what we need, a cybersecurity expert. Uh, there are t so having worked in technology for the past 15 years, there's one thing I would like to mention and get out the way sh uh, straight away. Houthis do not have the technology or the know-how to get 1,200 kilometers into Saudi territory and bomb it. I've read up in detail. Well, how were they able to attack uh, air bases? Uh, several of them. Several, several, several of those air base attacks were limited. You've got to remember, to control a drone 1,200 kilometers away, you need the technology, you need satellite, access to a satellite to be able to control that drone. They do not have that. And then, number three, they use Lockheed Martin air defense systems. You need to have stealth technology to get that far. Houthis do not have that. Iran does not have that. To be very, very clear. Who does that leave then? Okay, so that's one thing. Four months ago, intelligence sources from within Pakistan said that Saudis were warned that there's a black swan operation about to happen to trigger conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Both countries were warned that there's a black swan operation about to happen. This is now, a, a black swan. You mean the, the mercenary force? Something was going to happen. So it's an event that's going to cause uh, a change in the policy, mm -hmm. country's policy straight away. So they were warned four months ago, and it was on TV, and we all knew about it. We were just waiting for it to happen. Now, it's quite strategic that they use cruise missiles. Now, that's another point. Cruise, only five countries in the world have cruise missiles. Iran is not one of them. Well, it's a cruise type of missile. Cruise type of missile, have to but... have uh, cruise written on it. No, but the point is you would have to have stealth technology to bypass the air defense system to begin with, right? Does Iran have stealth technology? I'm not so sure about that. That's you do. You do need it. So you, to get that far into Saudi Arabia... So that's one thing. Then what you've got to figure out is who benefits from the conflict. Mm -hmm. You have Saudi a higher... Uh, uh, we're running out of time. You have a higher appreciation of Saudi defence capability than I do and a lower appreciation... No, no, I, I don't. ...offensive capability. No, I, I, I appreciate what the Houthis have done over the last five years to defend themselves. What if the Saudis were all asleep? But, but the, point, the point I'm trying and to their make is there's, there's, there's also the, a very strategic <clears throat> point that we're all missing it. Even though the drones are there, for example, right? Every, all this technology is there. Who benefits? That's the key, key question. Saudis don't benefit from it. Iran doesn't benefit from a conflict. Who benefits in the long run from the conflict? That's the question we have to ask yeah. ourselves. What's your answer? Yeah. And my answer is, from a conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, right, Israel benefits the most. Israel benefits the most. Look at the election results. Look who's, who's eventually going to be the prime minister, the former chief of army staff. Look at what he said about declaring, the, uh, basically, annexing large parts of the Jordan Valley, large parts of West Bank, and extend Israel's sovereignty over those areas. So you have to look at, and then you have to look at another, another uh, aspect. Well, we don't have time for that. Okay. I want this lady to speak, Thank you. and she'll have to be, unless she's extraordinarily brief, the last speaker. Thank um. you. Um, thank you. I'm um, Dr. Siana Shafi. I'm a, um, recently a humanitarian GP, So, and um, um, I'm nearly in my fifth decade of life, just touching on your uh, reference to age there. Um, and although in the West we've lived in um, utmost peace, thankfully, um, I was not born here. I was born in Sri Lanka, but my um, ancestors come from possibly Yemen. So I have an interest in kind of human preservation. Um, and I just wanted to say one, at least one point, which is um, this observation um, I think everybody touches on is the cowardice of leadership and how they, the, the proxy war thing on on you can you can kill from a distance you don't have to be involved it just has to be push button control uh, uh de devaluation of life and absolutely no bravery whatsoever i mean how will our history books look in the future to describe our current leaders uh we know how we think of our current leaders but there is no heroism um and 
so th this thing that that human life means nothing and that leaders play no legitimate games. I mean, there are rules for wars. There used to be rules for wars. And people don't stick to those rules anymore. So in my current job, I see all the victims from Syria, from Iraq, from Yemen. Um, f actually, not many from Yemen um, because people are trapped there. And it, you, how do you divide a country? And, and what, what's the purpose of it? And I think it's amazing your skill, sir, as a cyber technologist. Um, but I'm really pleased that you asked the question about who benefits. And I think that is the rhetorical yeah, thing. Yeah, always. Dr. Traore, finally. Yes, uh, so I think that uh, according to what I've heard today is um, we all know who is partly responsible in all the chaos we see today in Yemen, especially uh, we, the West, uh, European countries and, and the United States. But I'm sure that next year we will have the same thing, uh, a new war starting and, uh, uh, and asking the same questions. The reason is um, this one, in my opinion. Um, we are all responsible because of uh, the way we, we behave, which means that we do not denounce, we do not condemn uh, what, uh, all the, the, what the United States are doing, what the UK is doing, what France is doing, when they commit bad crimes and they kill other people. So that's, the sad part. that's a very sad part. Well, the show uh, has to come to an end, uh, which is a pity, uh, because we could have discussed this for very much longer. I've been George Galloway. You've been a marvellous audience. Thanks very much for watching.